Hey, Pronouncers, welcome back to the Printable Pronouncers Podcast. I'm your host, Bruce from Printable. We've got Stephen Ferry from Camp Sync, and we've got Bear Ackerman over there. Now, um, we've got a fun episode. We were just catching up on a bunch of different topics. We haven't had an episode like this in a little bit. That would be nice. But uh, real quick, we've actually got um, four different companies that not only sponsor this industry, but help put together this show and make it happen. So make sure to check these four companies out. Number one, Multicraft Daddy's Contest. So here's one thing you got to do. Multicraft, pull up their Instagram, Multicraft underscore daddy, send him a DM. That will enter you in a chance to win a case of PMI tape. Send him a DM, tell him you listen to the pod and you appreciate him for sponsoring us. Thank you, Multicraft Daddy, who's up to 730 followers, I think. Ooh. And if you need ink supplies or a daddy, you know where to go. Multicraft Daddy, use Printavo for 15% off your first order. Sweet. Thanks, Daddy. Um, Oops, 10%. Okay. Bruce, uh, Supercolor actually just sent us an email with uh, a new way to order online. I think they're revamping a few things, but uh, Supercolor has innovated its transfer to make them even more easier to use. As Supercolor says, the world's best transfer just got better and it's incredibly easy to order now. Their next generation transfers are easier to peel. When the transfers are easier to peel, you have more confidence. When you have more confidence, you can decorate faster. And when you can decorate faster, you can make more money. As we can all agree, time is money in this business. Uh, regardless of the type of equipment you're using, Supercolor wants to make your experience super fast and super easy. Use 15% off your first order using promo code PRINTAVO15. Thanks so much, Supercolor. I just tried their... Uh, I'm just loading up their their order form right now. And yeah, it's all split out and it's, it's really clear. So that's awesome. Pumped to see it. Easy way. You know you shouldn't be spending all day cleaning dirty screens. Easy Way's line of environmentally conscious chemicals will get the job done faster and more efficiently, costing you a fraction of the cost per screen. 701, 842, those are Campus Inc.'s favorite Easy Way chemicals that clean dirty screens. Um, and the biggest thing, again, you guys know, they work with 100 plus distributors. They are there to help support you. They've got all the how-tos, the best practices, and they can answer your questions. Give Easy Way a try. Thanks, Easy Way. Bruce, do you need a solution to improve efficiency and reduce costs in your art department? Yeah. If you go to 1900 Hot Stuff, you're going to find Nick Wood, Lucas, Brent. Graphic Source offers industry leading outsource options for your shop by truly becoming a part of your team. They plug and play with Printavo and other shop management softwares. You're going to hear us talk about it on the podcast today. But when it comes to SEPs, mock ups, creative art, order management, embroidery, digitizing, back office admin, and customer service, there's no better company in our industry to work with. They have over 30 years in the game and they really know and understand shop needs and have a proven track record of success. Hit up the Printavo pod. You'll get 50% off your first vector, SEP, or embroidery order. Thanks so much, Graphic Source. Yeah. And uh, thanks to all you guys for subscribing. We crossed over 10,000 subscribers, which is really cool. So I appreciate you. We told our wives and they were like, cool. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah. All right. Jumping on in. Welcome back to the Printavo Apprentices Podcast. Bruce from Printavo, Stephen Fair, Campus Inc., and Bear Ackerman. What's okay. Up, Bear? Um, yeah, in a in a in a podcast studio here, <laughs> uh, <laughs> trying some uh, uh, unique fairs in LA, hanging out a little bit of work stuff, a little bit of vacation stuff. Uh, you had a couple meetings. Um, I've got a lot of topics actually to go over. Is there anything? First of all, how's the shop? We haven't talked about that since we have a couple guests. Um, shop's good. Uh, we're starting to get slower for the summer, so it's time to rebuild. And um, yeah, I haven't been in the shop much, which You're, is great. Like the production shop? You, production, yeah. Or have you been in the office? Or um, I've been by myself. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what, what brought you out of the production? Um, I mean, I know you've been talking about that for a long time. It's not any better when I'm there. <laughs> <laughs> it's, in fact, <laughs> it, it doesn't incrementally get that much better when I'm there. So I just I go pop in for a little bit and then I leave. Um, just go say hi. 
it also like empowers our leaders to be leaders and not just an extension of me. Mm-hmm. So like we have two, like we have incredible leaders there um, that have a lot of maturity, bring a lot of wisdom from other industries. And it's like, they're going to figure it out. And so it's just like giving them the freedom to figure it out. And sometimes I'll hit them up and be like, Hey, sorry, I've been a little MIA. And they're like, no, we're, we're good. You've got stuff you got to be worrying about. That's what you hired us for. So shout out Chad, Jenna, Mila, Craigan. That must feel pretty good. Did that happen? Like, was there something that made that happen or was that just over time? Um, we did, f- we, we have a really incredible group of leaders there. Um, and Jed will always come in. Like Jed, Jed's other office is like a mile away. And Jed, for uh, people that don't know, Jed is Steven's business partner. Yeah, Jed's my business partner. Um, and he like he can do everything in the business, but he's not like he does everything, but he is not there every day. He owns other companies. He's got other jobs, and he'll go check in on stuff if there's something that's going wrong or something that went down, he can fix just about anything. But he'll go in and tell the team, like, hey, we don't want Steven here. If Steven's here, something's wrong. Like Steven, <laughs> Who does he say that to? He'll say that to the production team. Oh, gotcha. Like He'll be like, we need Steven to be doing whatever he's doing, right? and we need to be here doing this. Hmm. So there's definitely a mindset shift. Um, and like half our team is in Chicago selling, and without them, we don't have production. So like we're okay being separate. We don't all want to be on. Yeah. I don't know. You guys went from being in office to being totally remote. How was that? Fortunately, as a company, I never liked being in one office every single day. So the company was built off that and that I came in Monday, Wednesday, Friday, maybe, or whatever, a couple of days. And so the, the, <clears throat> the process and procedures were always built around that. And then with COVID, obviously, we got rid of it fully. Uh, but I think that's cool. I, I wonder at what point should shops be like, all right, now I shouldn't be physically here as much. Was it a person thing or? I mean, I think it's, fit- a, it's a control thing, right? Like shop owners say, like when I talk to them, I'm like, why are you in the shop every day? Like if I'm not there, something will go wrong. And it's like, let it go wrong. See how they react. <laughs> I don't know if, if, you, if, if you don't let that happen like if you're not afraid to iterate and like uh like if you're not afraid to fail yeah then how are they ever going to learn so like f- you know failure is an option you know what's interesting um when our new CEO James came in I think one thing that I watched him do pretty well was he came in and he he didn't go into the weeds where I think the owner does a lot, mm. where, you know, because you have an affinity, you have a connection to it. He was a lot more executional and he let people mistake. And then next week, hey, what happened with that? Are we good? Or did you figure it out? And then he moved on. But he was OK, whereas it's easy to watch something poor happening and you want to fix it immediately. Um that was where I realized, oh, that that's the skill set that he is okay watching it sort of flounder a bit and just letting it happen and then going to check on it the next day or the next week. I think one of the biggest mistakes small business owners make is so much control, not letting their people have the opportunity to fail. And because of it, they never learn how to think for themselves, right? So um, yeah, failure is an option. Learn to embrace it. <laughs> All right, what else you got? All right, I've got, um, we talked about macroeconomics one couple episodes ago with regional banks. You mentioned your like partners and advisors said, hey, don't be using one regional bank. Make sure to use a couple banks with what happened with Silicon Valley Bank and some others. And it does look like some other regional banks are starting to fail. First Republic Bank started to, uh, did fail and was bought by JP Morgan. Um, there's another one that's been in the news a lot uh, lately, Pacific West. And um, there's actually some significant cracks with regional banks um, and their stock prices and valuations are showing it. And so I think what your advisors told you was really good though. And that just make sure, sure, have that banking relationship, someone who will lend you money if you need to, but then also 
work with a bigger bank. Did you set, did you do that or are you still on the docket? Yeah. Like we have some with our regional bank that does like our commercial mortgage and then we have some money in Chase just because it's <clears throat> Chase. I don't know. You don't want to get locked out. You yeah. You can't make payroll. Mm-hmm. <clears throat> um, no. So I, the reason I bring that up is, is it's like, yeah, I'll do it later. I'll do it later. I think it's just something, make sure to set up and have, and, and, uh, you just don't know. It's a really, really weird it's, time. It's not as much about like the $250,000 limit. It's more of like just liquidity, right? Like, do you have a hundred grand sitting in a random account liquid that you can just like pull on if you need to, God forbid, mm-hmm. if something got locked up. Yeah. Um, so the 250 thing is like kind of going away now. Yeah, there's without going too too deep separately, there is a lot of talks that the 250 grand max isn't realistic in today's day and age, especially with business businesses. Like if you're making payroll to 50 people, you have more than 250 grand in an account at a time. And so you're telling us as a business that you want us to potentially be at risk. And so that's where they're saying this needs to be revamped and maybe we pay a certain amount for extra insurance. But for right now, it is funky um, for businesses that are larger to to yeah. keep so much cash. From in a one personal place. finance, I didn't realize the the business limit was two fifty until SVB. Um, that's such a low amount. <laughs> it's it's scary for for bigger folks because you never think, oh, something will happen until their funds were frozen. Right. Um, so, okay. Um, I had something that um, I saw. So I'm I'm part of the uh, Blue Crew and. Facebook as well. Uh, mm. MNR's uh, Facebook group where, you know, people share ideas or things or um, issues, all that kind of stuff. And there was a post that was from Peter Walsh uh, that said, I'm just going to read a quote from it. Hey, good morning, uh, group. The mothership could use your help to debunk some false rumors being spread by our competitors that MNR is no longer manufacturing our equipment in the U.S. Never mind that these competitors aren't contributing many, if any, manufacturing them jobs themselves, but um, uh, we do manufacture a, a, a huge chunk of our equipment here. And here's a video of our facility in Roselle, of which. You've been there, right? Oh yeah, Rich Hoffman uh, gave us tours. Yeah, back in the day, remember? Yeah, totally. unbelievable. Like, Rich giving that tour is 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 special. I'm glad we got to do that because um, just the level of detail. Dude, that he, would he would pull walk up around. a sticker and be like, "That's how I know who put this part on." Yes, you remember he that? knew, and it's a hundred thousand square foot. So you guys can go there. Um, anyway, cool, cool spot. Uh, the reason why I bring this up though is I was thinking about it, and I was like, hmm all right, that's good to dispel anything that may be not true about the company, but does anyone actually care where stuff's made? I mean, MHM's made in Austria, Rock's made in Portugal, Anatol's made in in Chicago and maybe a split elsewhere. MNR, I know they were manufacturing in Poland and US and now they have like an uh, an India partnership. I mean, people buy their stuff on Uline and Walmart and all these other places and Amazon that's made everywhere in Asia. I thought if the quality is there, but the service component, it always felt like a shop. It's like everybody offers decorated pro. You could find a provider, but it's the service with the account manager. And are they there to meet the deadlines? And are they there to help you when something goes wrong? That really makes or breaks a relationship. I agree. So I, th- I think there's a part. Okay. There, there's, there's individuals that take pride in made in America things, right? Like totally made in America, American wages, American, like everything. And I think there is some pride to be said there if, if something is 100% manufactured and made in America. Uh, but that doesn't discount, you know, customer service or support. So like if you, it's a cool add on, but it shouldn't be the reason your product sucks or your service sucks. But I don't think people care. And so like, let's think about this. So like, okay, maybe the sportsman is made in America, but the servo amplifiers are made by Mitsubishi and mm-hmm. those come from China. And I'm sure every company's like that, yeah. And if you look at the eye image, well, there's print heads that come from a different company overseas, but then they're assembled here, right? Um, 
right? And so like, okay, the copperhead is coming from India, but then you know, some stuff is assembled and shipped here. At this day and age, I don't think anyone cares as much as does my machine work really, really well? And is the support and service provided also impeccable? If those two things aren't solved, then I don't think it matters as much. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. Um, So it's like, you know, I, I give a lot of credit to like rock was always the underdog in, okay, they're coming from Portugal. It's hard to get parts. It's hard to get this. It's hard to get that. Well, what have they been doing over the last five, six years, beefing up their warranty, having distribution centers, you know, in Florida, having techs that are flying around more. And they're going to solve that problem over time, Mm -hmm. right? Now you can look at it and say, wow, that is a, you know, beautiful press from Portugal and they have a support team here. Does anyone care? Um, My business partner, Jed, actually, he was really, he got the tour by Rich Hoffman back in the day. Mm -hmm. And he's like, why wouldn't we buy our machine from here? It'd be silly not to. Mm -hmm. And like in the last week, we've had support issues. He's like... I don't give a shit where it's from. Can I get my parts or not? Right. You know, so I don't know. I don't think it matters as much anymore. What do you think? All right, real quick. I got to tell you something. This is really interesting. And here's why we formed a company called Inktavo. You may have heard of it, but it has three different brands right now. Printavo, Inksoft, and Graphics. So we're all sister companies now, a big happy family. What we're able to do is Printavo is managing your shop management and workflow organization. Inksoft can run your website and handle online stores at scale. So running multiple different stores for fundraisers, schools, um, company stores, and everything in between. And Graphics Flow is a brand new product to be able to help reduce all the back and forth with art. So it has a huge art library that you can put on your website so customers can see and pluck what they want. Plus, you can also be able to collect different ideas and send them to customers to approve as well. Really, really cool. Plus in-app editing. It's like Canva, but specifically for shops. All right, check it out. All those brands are on inktavo.com. That's inktavo.com. All right, thanks. I don't think it matters at all. I, I mean, I think some people like to fantasize that certain things are made in the States and are, and, and, you know, feel good about it. But the reality is, is like when you go down the supply chain, like you said, you, you know, maybe steel is coming from uh, Canada or China, or maybe, you know, servo parts coming from this place. So it's like, we're thinking about surface level stuff. You know what I mean? It's like, Oh, this, this t-shirt's made in the U S it's like, is it like, is, is the yarn sewn here? Is, is, was, was the cotton grown here? Was it dyed here? Like some of them? Sure. But, uh, you know, it's, it's a weird, it's a weird word and it's a, it's an interesting balance, especially on the cost basis where things also cost way more. I just think the bottom line is, and, and this isn't picking on any company. It's just like it emphasizes the fact for every company that I think half the business and relationship with the customer is from the service side and the support right. side. I think that people can find solutions to do whatever they need anywhere. And there's so much competition in free market that you can find the products anywhere. But like what makes or breaks any strong business relationship is like, Service. It, oh gosh, what was the quote that you said? It's uh, the, the loyalty is built in loyalty is built in conf or resolution. No, resolution. Yeah, yes. we say that all the time. Loyalty is built in resolution. Um, so anyway, I love that quote, and I think this totally exemplifies it, and and just makes you think. I call out companies all the time when their support sucks. And what do you mean by call out? I will let someone know in their leadership team when their support sucks. That's fair because I just I bet think, it helps too. I just think you're doing it like it's. This is what I tell every. This is like a pet peeve of mine. Like everything's gonna break at yeah. some point. You're gonna need service. Use your service as your marketing department. Yeah. Right. Like, what if your service department was actually your marketing department, and your marketing department ran your service department? And it was all about like how happy you can make people and like how quick you could answer phones and like you were measuring like resolution time. That's how you grow a company is by turning your service department into your marketing department. And when I see it not happening, I feel like I should tell the owner or tell someone up there being like, hey, like that 
it doesn't leave a good taste in our mouth or we don't feel good about it. And you should maybe think about that differently. I actually just met with a shop. We did a really cool shop tour in LA two days ago. The owner actually had an issue with our support where he was like, I, I write in these questions. I have three questions, but I only get the answer to the first one all the time. Hmm. And I was like, Whoa, that sucks. Send me the copy of that, please. It's Bruce Pentavo. And he sent it today. I got to take a look, but I like it because then I could just forward it over. We can correct it. I don't think the person ever means to right. create an issue, but it's like, Hey dude, uh, you know, just answer all the questions. Like, do you see how this can be frustrating? Um, okay, sure. Right. All right. Done. Mo we can move on. Yeah. You look at a lot of successful companies and you hear their CEOs say like their owners are living in their support channels. And that's how they know the true measurement of their company is like when they're living in in feedback. Did you read Delivering Happiness? Yes, Tony okay. Shea. Awesome book. If you haven't read it, uh, the late Tony Shea, I guess late, now yeah. he passed out. Or passed out. Passed. <laughs> he passed. <laughs> um, uh, really great book. And his whole thing was their support team. So he started the, the company Zappos which is, I believe, bought by Amazon. But yep. basically, you know, online shoe seller, if you haven't used it, especially in a time where selling shoes online was not a thing and it was weird and they would do free shipping, free returns, uh, really great customer service, went way over the top. His whole thing was my support team is... Uh, not only does everyone participate in it in the company, whether you're an engineer or you're in sales mm. or you're, you know, warehouse, whatever, to understand what customers are thinking, but support is an investment in our brand. Mm. He's like, a lot of people look at it as, as a cost center. It's an investment in the experience your brand has when they, you know, they may see you in, in, on a billboard, they may see your ad, they may get an email and then, um, if they deal with our support, it makes them feel good as well. So, yeah. And Amazon actually bought Zappos based on a lot of, it wasn't just that they were selling shoes. It's that they had a great return policy. They had great customer support. They had a mm -hmm. great service center. Um, and we got this question when we were talking to Connor from St. Louis Shirt Co. Like, do you take returns? Do you, what if a customer wants to exchange something? And I know shops out there that run online stores will be like, nope, all sales are final. No returns, no exchanges, whatever. But like, think about how many people you rub the wrong way when you just tell customers that. And so like, I'm not scared of my competition in our NIL space because they don't offer returns, exchanges or anything else. Oh, you do? Fun. What? Oh, you yeah. Do? Really? I really yeah. I mean, it's just like, it's a parent that's angry. It's a person with something that didn't fit. Do you do these for the stores too? Yep. Wow. Yep. Just because like, okay, say it's... Say it's a thousand dollars a month. Like, how much are you gonna pay to make you know that many people happy, right? Like, whatever. You just kind of like eat it. It's a good way of thinking um, about it. And you know, in the back of your head, you're just keeping everyone happy. I don't know. I like it. Um, where are we at on time? This first time using this equipment. All right. Um, okay. I had the next topic here was um, there was an article in Screen Printing Mag that talks Ooh. about $1,000. Could you spend $1,000 on marketing? Where would you spend it? The um, magazine basically said we would divvy it in fourths. Uh, 250 would go towards positive reviews, so sending emails to people who've had a good experience using buying a tool like that, and then generating positive reviews, which great. Social proof is huge. $250 would go to influencers in the local market. Hmm. Interesting. Um, influencers have a really good ROI. It's very hard to measure. I don't think coupon codes do a good job. It's just brand presence and um, people trust influencers for making decisions. $250 on prizes for marketing contests. That was interesting. And then $250 on branding custom boxes and shirt giveaways. Uh I personally thought, so there's two, two questions. Number one, I'm curious, what would you spend a thousand on? And then I want to ratchet it up as a second question. I thought I would just do two, one on a continuous positive review cycle, which a not only makes you look good when you're searching for, you know, custom shirts in Tennessee or whatever, but also helps buffer you if you get negative reviews. Um, so you don't get uh, dinged on that. 
And then the other one I said was what we talked about with Kevin Baumgart in the last episode is custom boxes of constantly sending stuff out. Anybody Pretty that swag. we're quoting above, say, you know, a couple thousand dollars, send them something out right when they're quoting so they get it quickly, they see it, and that you can close that customer. Um, so I think one takeaway I would say is investing in a program that's going to last a while. So like if you had a thousand dollars and it was a tool for, you know, 50 bucks a month that did positive reviews, letting that thing run for a full year, because I think one of the biggest areas of weakness that shops might make is they think that it's like a splash and dash, like, Oh, my marketing is going to pay off right away when really you need to let marketing run for a while. So like, I would take that thousand dollars and invest it into one or two things that last 12 months. Mm, um, that's actually a good point. You know, because I think I just feel like if you don't let a marketing campaign run long enough, you really don't understand the results of it. I feel like I've done that. Or you run a Facebook campaign for a couple of like, weeks oh, and you're I like, ran an ad, it, it doesn't work. work. Yeah. And I'm like, <sighs> I've been there. So I, I would, I would try to do it into something long tail where you could see it running. Um, like, we used a tool called Signpost for five star reviews, and I let it run for it was like twenty five hundred bucks a year. I let it run for three or four years. We've got five hundred five star reviews. You know, Justin Lawrence turned me on to it. So Signpost, Signpost, com. yeah. There's like Bird's Eye Signpost. Do you still use it, or did you? Um, no, it? I got rid of it because um, we have five hundred five star reviews. <laughs> <laughs> You're like, I'll take twenty five hundred back. Uh, but no, and then I like connected it to a zap now to just like get the ones that I want. How did you get those? How was it a zap that auto did this or how did it work? So basically how signpost worked was anyone our company interacted with four weeks, three weeks later, it sent them a thing like asking from like a net promoter score. Like how likely are you to, re how likely are you to refer um, campusing to someone else? Mm -hmm. And then if it was like a four or a five, it would then be like, Oh, would you mind leaving us a review? Oh, out of five. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, maybe out of 10. I don't remember. It wasn't, it wasn't net promoter school. Cause that would be out of 10. Um, or it was like, how, how was your experience? Anything four or five, it would then put them in a bucket and send them a request for a review. And the review would come from me personally. If it was anything mm. less than a four, um, it would say like, uh Oh, what was wrong with your experience? And then it would actually come to me as well. And we could try and solve it. So I learned a lot about what went wrong. Um, in the business, um, when I had, had it running, like I never got my stuff or my size wasn't wrong or this or that. And it's like, Oh, okay, we'll fix this. Okay. We'll fix that. So that's cool. Uh -huh. Okay. If we were to ratchet this up and it wasn't just marketing, but let's say you had a hundred thousand dollars to invest in your shop right now today. And, and actually I want to do this for today and I want to do this for like maybe two or so years ago before you fundraised too. Mm. Um, so let's do today. What would that be? So I think if I had a hundred thousand dollars, historically I'd want to buy something fancy and shiny and new. Like what? Press? <laughs> like a piece of equipment. And now I'd rather hire a specialist or hire a person that focuses on one thing and like overpay the crap out of them because they were really, really good. Like hire an SEO agency that was just like the Rolls Royce of SEO. And then just could optimize for everything local and every market. Yeah. Right. Because when you go to a site and you're like, damn, they've got awesome SEO. Or like yeah. I would hire a, like the best agency to do Google ads, right? Or I would hire like something that you... So your bucket is 100% marketing spend. Marketing or sales, right? Because SEO is going to like, okay, say you hired two, you know, one salesperson. Um, you got like one of the best salespeople in your community and their salary was 100 grand after commission. They're going to generate hopefully five, six, seven hundred thousand dollars $700,000. So I could buy a press that could print or I could buy a person, hire a person that could sell more. And so my mind is always growth, growth, growth. If I had a dollar, what about you? Wait, 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 before we go over, what about 
two, what about, let's call it three years ago before fundraising and before kind of the, the business took a turn? Like, cause I think more people can relate to that. Um, what do you think about then? So I think in my younger years, I would have again wanted something fancy. Mm. So I would have been like, Ooh, let me upgrade this press. Let me buy this. This is cool. Like an auto reclaim. And I think all of those are awesome, but those don't grow your business. They just support it. So I think if it was three years ago, I'd try to hire really like a really, really good leader like a really good sales manager or a really good operations manager or like a CFO. Uh Um, Having a CFO on our team is like really cool. So like just a very talented person that is almost, that can almost run the company for you. What is cool about having the CFO? Like what are some, a couple of things? I mean, we recently have one now as, as of the last year or so, but we didn't have one before. And I was always trying to find the fractional, but now that once you, you work a, directly with him, what, what is the benefit? Okay, and you guys have a CFO too, Stuart, right. who's awesome. Mm-hmm. Um, they just operate on such a more professional wavelength of like finance and money. <laughs> 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 and they just like, just get out of the way. <laughs> and then they just give me the rails to operate in like, nope, you can't you can't do this. You can't do this. Is this a good, it's just so mathematical and precise and that's all they focus on and they're dedicated. And like, I just trust them. I trust them way more than I would trust myself. It makes me feel like I was in first grade running finance in our company and I just got a high schooler. They're like, what's your performa? And you're like, Pro forma? What? I didn't have to, I, the first time I heard that I was, I was like quickly oh, Googling. Okay. Yeah. Um, and then, yeah, when you when you get someone that's dedicated and they're an expert, they're just giving you literacy um, and clarity, and then you don't have to like try to be a hacker about everything and and like not understand it or whatever. Do you think that because they're also bought in being full time, it's much better? Like, could it have worked someone part? Because obviously that's a big role to hire for. It's expensive. It's a big commitment. Can people? really do a fractional CFO? And I know you tried a couple. Yeah, I mean, those are just like firms that have other priorities and they're going to give you a certain amount of their time. But if you can afford at least a, you know, you don't need a CFO or a controller, but like a really experienced bookkeeper, you know, um, someone like that's worked in QuickBooks for 30 years and they just, they understand the books very well of small business um that could give you a lot of clarity too you know when do you think it would be the best time to have hired that role looking back then and not necessarily as much the cfo but like a stepping stone a good like a 1.5 million dollars really because that's a lot smaller than i thought i think about how many mistakes i made from like 1.5 to 3.5 or like financial ones yeah like I don't know how many things I goofed up. <laughs> I don't want to know. Yeah. Uh, I have no idea what those could be. I don't, I don't, I don't want to go back to those days. But um, yeah, I mean, just having someone there that you trust. Um, like I know some print shops, their parents run their books and they just feel really good. Like, yeah, my parents do my books for me. And I'm like, oh, that's awesome. you know, it's so funny. Um, you know, for you running a shop and and wanting to going back like focus on equipment and production and like that's kind of the fun thing that was me for product stuff and i just wanted to invest more and more and more um in the product which i think obviously helps but i didn't have enough of the supporting roles elsewhere at that stage to be able to help me grow so the finance side the somebody owning all marketing somebody owning all of sales you know um, somebody owning all of success and really, I mean, a lead is very helpful, but someone totally taking it off your plate. So you're just updated once a week about it, not in it every single day. Um, that would have started to be my investment. And maybe that's one role to help with it. Maybe it's the finance side to start, or maybe it's, what someone- do you think your weakest role was then? Was it finance? Was it marketing? Cause you were literally doing everything. Um, you were product manager, marketing manager, sales a, manager, still trade show manager. Yeah, we had a good tech leader. I, I would have done, I think, two. One, I would have brought on an actual full-time assistant, 
like an office assistant, not, I mean, I think a part-time assistant is a huge step forward and you should do part-time before full to build the processes and the decks and like all the training materials. And then that full-time and then somebody running like success and support full-time. Hmm. So the account management I think was heavily undervalued in that that's retention. Like you're so focused on new and new and new, but somebody who knew how to scale the systems and like the help desk and, and the account management and the data looking at, and like all these areas to be able to fully own that. Cause we had a good, we had a good tech leadership, but that, that I think would have fleshed it out better. Hmm. Um, but you're right in the finance. Side, I think software is a little different, but I think, that and the assistant would have the assistant should have come the part-time assistant which we use belay solutions then and still do should have came i'm trying to think of maybe the best time 750k to a million revenue as well which seems small like oh i could keep doing it but that stage where you're at a million in revenue you are saying yeah you got to a million which is huge because you forced your way through it but you can't force your way through it post that. So stage. is what you're saying a shop's early hires should be an assistant or a finance yes. person? Yeah. I think that if the shop owner, if any business owner for the matter uh, for, for it was doing more stuff that added higher value and less of the 70% of the day, which is just like little like pebbles um, adding into the glass, I think there you just be able to take a lot bigger leap every year. Um, there's a movie I just watched recently called Founder. It's the McDonald's movie. Have you seen it? A long time ago. But. Okay. So it's really interesting because you have the two McDonald's brothers, um, and one was a very like you would say he is the screen printer, like nerded out, loved the process, could never leave printing. And then one brother that like sort of understood the finance, but then they never had like the sales or marketing or whatever, and they could just never grow. And you see the personalities when Ray Kroc meets them of how the three of them try to coexist. And I think what was interesting or what how this relates to this is in every business, the owner's going to take on a different personality. They could be very sales and marketing focused. They could be very production focused. They could be very finance focused. But it's imperative that you solve for those missing pieces as quickly as you can. Mm. Um, so good movie. Everyone should watch it. <laughs> yeah, I need to go rewatch it. Yeah. Okay. Um what that's else? the hundred thousand dollars. I think that's good. Is there anything else you'd spend on? No? I don't know. I think I think that's pretty good. Okay. Um Oh, I would have hired my graphics artist sooner. That was a big light bulb. Oh, like signed up with Graphex? Mm -hmm. Why? It was just a bottleneck that I didn't know existed. And then once I solved for it, I was like, oh my gosh, I should have done this years ago. You're welcome, Nick Wood. Well, because <laughs> well, you had art in-house for a while, if I remember, right? Yeah. And it was always a bottleneck. Well, like as in a physical bottleneck or just a mental bottleneck? Physical, just, like, dealing with yeah, it. like it was always, we were always chasing our tail, trying to get mock-ups out, trying to get steps done. It was always like, and then once we really focused on automating our art department, it now is like a strength of ours. Mm. Um, and so it just like completely erased um, having that issue, right? Um, and so now I think about like, okay, I think about those things as I would never... I don't know where I would be without them or like, don't take them away from me. The other thing is like, how long was our ramp up time, by the way, uh, like probably like 30 to 60 up. days, 60 okay. days. But like another, another big ticket item that I could never do without is like our, um, wax jet, our CTS. Take that away from me. I'll murder you. Right. Um, <laughs> they need to clip that. That's great for them. <laughs> right. But like that, that's what I'm saying is like, those are ticket items. Okay. If there were some things like it was direct to screen, it was graphics without them, those two things, like I could use whatever press, give me whatever. 
Um, put me on a brown. <laughs> Don't take away direct to screen. You're a free agent, but you have to go with GraphX and your, your yeah, wax direct ETS. Screen. Um, I, I had something interesting I actually wanted to share with you and put in here. So we released, and this hasn't been public yet, but um, Printable Capital. Uh, so <clears throat> if you're using Printable Payments, we're able to start to mine that data to know how much to loan that we could extend. And so they can loan, uh, and you can use money for anything. It's very similar to Stripe Capital or PayPal Capital's basically the same thing. <clears throat> um, it's grown really quickly. We're almost at a million dollars of people. Funded. That- that have people, yes, that have funds that have gone out. And to be clear, this isn't like Printavo's bank. You guys are partnering with a big. <laughs> yes, this is partnering with a company um, that underlying called Paraffin. That's like the the underlying partner, and you'll probably see emails from them or partnered with them. But uh, what I find interesting is some of the reasons, and I was kind of curious on um, what you would use it for as well. But top reasons are number one was equipment. Um, makes sense, especially you don't have a good credit rate or you find this has a better interest rate than what you'd get. Next was inventory, then payroll and or hiring. I'm assuming through different ups and downs or slow periods, marketing, then rent. Um, then there's like kind of other, which could be remodeling or expansion. So anyway, there's 40 odd folks. So the data is not fleshed out. I'll sort of, you know, come back to it when it is deeper, but I was curious what you thought about those reasons. Do they align? Like, have you guys done something like this? Yeah. And then what do you use it for? So like we've used a Stripe Capital before um, to like pull on when we wanted to maybe buy something. And so what's nice about these type of loans is um, it extends your runway and gives you more of like a cushion. And then correct me if I'm wrong, but it takes a small percentage out of every dollar that comes back until you pay it back. Right? Yeah. So, um, you know, if you wanted, if you wanted to buy a press that was a hundred grand, you could effective and and you did a million dollars in payments every year, you could effectively buy it and like sweat it off and not feel it. And, and, and so I think it's really positive there and I've heard of shops doing it there for us. Like I consider that almost a line of credit. And so a line of credit should be used for like a couple things, accounts receivable, Right. And so if you are taking huge POs that take a while to get paid, you can use some of that capital to, you know, get, basically get you paid right away. Um, and then the other one is um, like your payroll. So if you know during your summer months, you're going to be a little bit slower, it can, you can use that capital to help your contribution margin out if you're going to crush it in November and October, but you know that July is going to be super slow. So, I mean, it's like, it's using it as leverage, right? Um, and, and the way that we think about it, because we are we raised like several million dollars and we have to deploy that money right away. And we have to know if we put $1 in the machine, what comes out of it. And so um, I think it's a very simple way for shops to maybe experiment with it hmm. on a lower risk. Yeah, because um, you could just take five grand use it for, you know, you got to buy equipment or whatever it is. You pay it off over the next month or a couple months. Yep. 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 Um, yeah. And so and it, they're very clear cut now. I mean, I know I, these sort of cash advances had definitely a bad connotation when it was a lot grayer, but with how payment processing works now, it's so much more transparent. Um, with yeah. the fee you're going to pay up front, here's the money. And then you just pay back the original money. Yeah. Back. And this, it was pretty cool. Like, so we were, we were reading up on that. Um, fortunately we don't really have to pull on them a lot right now, but like, you know, Shopify was, was offering it too because of how much you know, revenue we had going through there. Printavo has it too, because of like, how, and I think what's cool is Printavo and the team knows your data and knows your sales cycles. They're not going to outlend you. Like they're not going to give you they're going to give you a certain amount because they know based on your business, you'll be able to pay it back. Exactly. Yeah. Right. So you don't even really have to like run a credit check or anything because they just, they know that. Yeah. There is no, there is no credit pool. It's just kind of cool. Um, so I think that's pretty sweet. It's pretty cool that you guys are doing it because it's kind of like how like rock partnered with like Geneva capital a little bit mm-hmm. to like, Oh, you want to buy a press. You can't afford you know 80 or hundred grand. Here's Geneva. That's going to help you out. 
but it's kind of cool that you guys are doing it in this way. Um, haven't seen other like companies do it that like for small businesses like this besides like Stripe. Yeah. Okay. The last thing I want to leave everybody with before we wrap up here is uh, I saw this tweet that I thought was pretty good, especially when determining if you keep a team member or part ways. And he said, the number one sign you need to move on from a team member, you're doing a lot of their job. <laughs> or another employee is doing a lot of their job. Somebody is doing their job. Yeah. How do you know that without a really clear job description? Well, there is, maybe that's on us then. <laughs> At least if there's no good clear job so, description. So, I don't know. We, uh, we had to let a couple people go. And it wasn't until we really fleshed out their job description that it was very clear they weren't meeting expectations. Oh, so you brought them on and there wasn't like a job description stuff yet. Um, I mean, they kind of knew their role. They had their role definition, but it wasn't until they were underperforming that we realized their job description wasn't super clear. So then we created it, reset expectations, gave them an opportunity to like live up to them. They weren't, but then we could at least compare their performance to what their job description was. And it's black and white. And it's black and white. Which is good because it's on us as an owner to make it super clear. Yeah. But somebody said that it was like, if if they don't know that they are getting fired for non-performance, then you did a bad job with yeah. setting them up to succeed. Yeah. And a lot of like failures, we'll take it on us and be like, we could have, you know, we could have set up a better opportunity for them. Some people, it just doesn't work out. And they're, what do you call it? Silent quitters? Quiet quitters. Quiet quitters, where they've like really quit their, what is that? They quit their job. They're like just not doing work, but sitting around um, pretending like they're doing work. Yeah. Uh, that pisses other employees off. Pisses oh. a lot of people off. Yeah. Because other people are working hard and they're passionate and they care about it. Just, just leave. Honestly, just leave. Go find something that you are really passionate about. It's fine. And that's what I tell people if I have to let them go, like it's not working out, but I want to give you the opportunity to go find something better for you. And we're going to all be happier because of it. I like it. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to the Printable Pronounces podcast. Hopefully this worked. Hopefully we have audio and video. <laughs> Hopefully this looked kind of cool. We'll try and do more. I, I feel like the vibe is always better in person. So I'm glad we got to do Good this. Good stuff. Uh, yeah. We'll see you in the next episode. Bye.